Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there at HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't match, don't match well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Age of Radio. This podcast contains adult content. Some of the themes or topics may include information on murder, kidnapping, torture, dismemberment, maybe some demonic content with information on positions and paranormal activity. This podcast will also include explicit, horrible and foul, socially unacceptable, totally uninhibited adult themes language. So if you're easily offended, if you're easily triggered, then I highly suggest you turn this off now. And if not, just keep in mind, parental discretion is advised. All right. Sorry for the delay. This is my part two episode with John Captain the third in regards to the Tiffany Jenks case here in part two. He answers some listener questions. We also go through and replay some of the really strange audio involving Tiffany. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, definitely reach out to John Captain the Third. He's given all his information a couple different times. If you have any questions, he's very willing to give more detailed answers, everything like that. So feel free to reach out to him if you feel like it. With all that being said, on with the show. Welcome back, John. How are we doing, dude? Good. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So, Tiffany's case is not like any other random case. There's a lot of weird stuff going on, per se. A lot of sketchy stuff. So, I had Misty in the Facebook group. She listened to this Audible book. By the way, it's a book by Tom O'Neill. And it is called Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s. And she said that it kind of makes a lot of theories surrounding Tiffany's death a lot more plausible. Now, she said there's a lot of information in the book. She said she had to listen to it a few times to absorb all the information that is getting thrown in that. And it is available on Audible as well for any listener who wants to check that out. I have heard a couple people do interviews about Charles Manson during the 60s and how he was involved with the CIA and when he went to Mexico and all this stuff. You said you were not familiar with the book, but you are familiar with the connections between 
all of this stuff and Tiffany, correct? Yeah, I, I said to you that um, there's a connection of one of her, or our, I should say, our acquaintances who is related to Sharon Tate, who was murdered here. She was from Oregon, I believe, or her family's from Oregon for sure. And uh, at the time, they had been sending people to befriend me to make sure that I behaved the way they wanted to in, the, in this murder, uh, in the response to the murder. And so there were a lot of people that came into my life. One of them is the nephew of Sharon Tate. Now, it's That's weird. pretty interesting right there. Yeah. That's it, definitely weird. weird, man. And, and if you don't understand mind control at all, or even, I guess, coercive, uh, you know, force, religion, different ones, um, when you have people sent to you, unless you're really smart and aware of all this stuff that could possibly happen, you wouldn't even think that they were there for any other reason than just to say hi and help out. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I have employees and I have a staff and I have a business, so it makes me vulnerable. But on the other hand, um, I do know now looking back that uh, I would say, you know, at least 10 people were put in my life about four months before the murder and within four months after. And those people, uh, as soon as I learned about mind control, they all disappeared, by the way. <laughs> so That is very, very strange. And to be honest with you, like as a person who doesn't trust my government as far as I can throw any single one of them. Yeah. You know, it's not surprising, unfortunately. And, like, it's funny because I always tell people, they're like, oh, the government wouldn't do that. And I'm like, are you not familiar with, like, straight up, like, Operation Sea Spray, where they straight up sprayed, like, the whole Bay Area of California back in, like, 1950 with, you know, aerosolized, you know, bioweapons just to see what would happen. You know what I mean? They did it to, uh, the whole Rockefeller Commission is full of shit like this, which is scary as hell. It, it's funny, or actually sad, that you mentioned that, because I've studied a lot of what you just talked about, except for in St. Louis, Missouri, where my Indian Yeah, they did it in St. Louis, yeah. Exactly. I'm very familiar with that. In yeah, they fact, did it in the ghettos. Yeah, they did it against the natives, which we had a tribe in Oklahoma, which, of course, is next to Missouri, but for, for people that aren't familiar with America... But regardless, um, and then what they were spraying was actually zinc cadmium sulfite, and it was to find out what would happen in the event there was a uh, uh, COVID-19, I mean, a, a biological attack on America. And not to say that they would ever do any kind of attack like that, but wait, they already did. So I don't even know what I'm saying. And I will <laughs> say, my dad lost his father at age four. My dad was four years old when his father, John S. Captain, died. And he died of zinc cadmium sulfite at age 36. So there was also a huge increase in people who died of cancer in that area, simply yes. because our wonderful U.S. government was killing people, period. And then on top of it, they yeah. even say that we don't have a right to see the documents. That's even more offensive. So There was actually a lawsuit brought up. I, I believe it was either a lawsuit or a woman brought it to the attention. And this was just recently, within like the last three or four years, Correct. because of in that particular section of St. Louis, which was pretty much impoverished area, the ghetto. Yeah. Um, I mean, dude, they would roll through in cars and like in the back of vans and just drive down the street spraying this shit. Correct. Right. So yep. there were, f I believe there were five cities that they hit with this shit. And honestly, I live in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and that was one of them. Oh, really? It was Fort Wayne, St. Louis. Uh, there was a city, I believe, in either Minnesota or Wisconsin, uh -huh. and then a couple more. And then, of course, the previous one was the uh, the predecessor was the the Bay Area. So the, the kicker was is this lady brought it up yep. because – a lot of her family members and a lot of people in that neighborhood, the cancer rate in the last 40 or 50 years has gone up significantly. She knew about this stuff and she remembered it and she was like, we need these questions answered here. And of course, the government put out some documents about how, well, the amount that we actually sprayed on you isn't poisonous or wouldn't affect your health adversely blah 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 and sure. it's like that's I, i'm not 100 percent sure that's not the that's not the point here <laughs> yeah, why are exactly. you doing this in certain areas like i don't know it, it's extremely troubling man and um and people don't know about this stuff yeah i agree they don't know it when i always go down the rabbit hole and you always it's funny because you hear conspiracy the word conspiracy theorist or conspiracy th theory thrown around as like an insult and it's like to be honest with you in the world of science theories are based on facts given 
this isn't a hypothesis. A hypothesis is like an idea that you're trying to prove, that you're trying to bring facts into the equation so that you can provide a plausible theory. Like, okay. so when you call people a conspiracy theorist, you're actually admitting that there are facts to provide to this theory, you know, or to provide yeah. to this idea. And I don't know, it just cracks me up because people have, like I said, have never read the Rockefeller Commission, and it is terrifying yeah. what the kind of experiments that our government has done on us without any of us knowing about. Well, not only that, but like the example of my grandfather dying of zinc cadmium sulfide after that area was sprayed multiple times, how does that affect my life forever? It's no different than right now. I'm fighting for justice for a dead girl in, in the murder of Tiffany. And the fact is, is that it affects my child more than anybody because I'm not a, I'm not a relevant father in my child's life simply because of the attacks that I'm under or the uh, financial burden that she will have to deal with if I don't succeed at getting justice. Because it's not cheap to fight these people. No, I mean, no absolutely not. Yeah. Or fair. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's definitely not fair by any means. Yeah. Um, I do have one question from Elizabeth, and she asked, um, have you ever feared for your life speaking out on all of this? And she said, everything with this case and the people involved is so sketchy. Yeah, unfortunately, a guy, a guy told me that, and I'm not saying this, this is what he told me. He said, Native Americans don't have fear. I don't know what, it, that, actually it was David Icke that told me that. And um, I've never felt fear. I'm afraid of rats and mice, oddly enough, but uh, and maybe a pigeon. You know, I don't want to touch it. But I don't have <laughs> fear of these people that I refer to a lot of as them or scumbags because I think that I always thought initially when that, the murder came up and I was investigating that eventually it would they would give up and say, okay, yeah, you're right. But I didn't know at the time what I was dealing with. I always thought at the very first few months, I thought that they just didn't trust me because of the murder and they didn't know if I was involved. I get that. But see, I knew I wasn't involved. So I, I was like, well, hello, we got to work on this. Initially, I, I, I left a message at her friend Rick Lovett's house and told him, hey, I have clues to the murder. And, and later he said, well, you know, John wanted me to stop everything and call him right away and work on the case, put our heads together. Uh, I thought, well, yeah, I did. I thought that he would do that. So I wasn't aware of what was going on and they certainly were. So it wasn't even a shock to them that she was dead. In fact, one of the photos that I found online which included the photos a uh, picture of my flowers that i'd sent for the funeral was photos of her family grinning ear to ear four days after the funeral and that's not normal my mom was crying the rosary and i was certainly upset and freaked out but i was never afraid for my life i never said in fact uh, one guy says it was a drug deal gone bad and you got to have security i said you just tell them to come here and i uh, believe me i'm not i'm not secure i'm just an old loser but bottom line is this i don't care what they do they're going to do what they have, whatever they have to do no matter what because i have one goal Tell the truth and make sure that in the future, when somebody has a murder, that the witness gets to tell a story in a court of law. And also, I'd say, when I called the judge to say, you guys are lying, you're not even telling the court case, and you guys are getting them off of murder charges, I left four or five messages or four or five facts on the recording, which included Tiffany crying for help and emails that she had sent, I have guns, I'm going to kill you, somebody sent from her account. And later, the DA said, we were trying to figure out a way to transcribe Mr. Captain's message to the record. And because we didn't know how to do that or if the audio would work, we decided to collectively to disregard his message. It was rambling and non-cyclical. And I said, that's funny. It was Tiffany. It was her crying for help. It wasn't me. I was the delivery person of her message that she knew she was going to die. So if that's rambling, yeah. then so be it. Yeah. This one's kind of an in-depth question. And there's a lot of factors, so feel free to break up your answers to address each issue. And this is, a lot of this is directed towards the TV show, the episode that was done about Tiffany. And um, this is from Elizabeth, and she says, So I just watched his show, and it was an episode about Tiffany Jenks. Now I'm even more confused. This case is such a mind screw. I really don't know how much fact was actually in this show. And this was addressed to me. She said, I trust your research way more than some TV show, which, thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate that. It says, in the episode, the mother and sister say they immediately thought it was Bill, quote-unquote, her on-and-off-again boyfriend, who you can tell was actually John Captain. 
saying they had issues and at times they had each had a restraining order placed on each other. Do you know if there is any truth to this? Maybe they did have a toxic relationship, but I'm wondering if they're just trying to put John Captain in a bad light. He is still speaking out about all this, so maybe they're trying to discredit him. They also get into the killing and the interrogations. They show part of Dan's interrogation, and he says the more he thought about it, the more he thought it was all planned out. Not by him, but by Josh and Michelle. That once again implies that Michelle and Josh knew her before this night. In Josh's tape, he says he sold his gun to Dan, and then he goes and kills someone with it. Yeah, Dan confessed to the shooting, but maybe Josh actually shot her and threatened or forced Dan to confess to shooting her. I don't know. There are more things that lead me to believe that scenario. I could go on forever with all the questions I have about this case, so I will stop. But if you have time, can you please ask John Captain if he has seen this episode and if he has, what are his thoughts on it? Yeah, good questions. Thank you. Um, and I like to hear questions because um, I'm glad that people are aware. I would say that the movie or ID Discovery Wonderland murder, Tiffany Jenks show, is about the most pathetic lie I've ever seen in my life. And um, not only is it offensive for Tiffany, as she probably would ask if she had time, it's offensive for Tiffany, but it should be offensive for anybody that watches it because they're all lying and they're all calling Tiffany names in order to get away with what they're trying to do, which is to make her in bad light so that I look bad as her John, which is my name anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But bottom line is about Daniel Burnell, Daniel Burnell being the shooter. Do I believe he shot her? Yes. Do I believe that Josh handed him the gun one second before he shot her? Yes. And then he was told, shoot her or we'll shoot you. His depositions with the police, his interview, is not shown or, re or spoken about on that show correctly. And what they'll say is, they'll say, well, he didn't really ask for a lawyer. He just kind of hinted at it. Daniel Burnell said specifically about six times, I want a lawyer. And then it had a period. And then it said, will you please stop interrupting me? I want a lawyer. So for the police to go on national TV and lie to the public, it's absurd. He asked for a lawyer multiple times, and they never gave him one. Another thing that I found was odd about that was uh, they had to claim that, and I don't know if it's a law because I, I have no clue, but they had an interview just before midnight on the 14th of October 2013, and then they interviewed him again just after midnight, about 10 minutes after midnight, a whole new interview. And they start off by saying, so, uh, Jason, do you remember the uh, time we met last time? You mean 20 minutes ago? Yeah, I remember. And I read you your rights? Yeah, okay. So it was like weird, right? They were trying to imply like it was a whole other day, but it really was just two minutes after midnight. So when the police interviewed Daniel Burnell, and he was not given a lawyer as he should have because they railroaded him, every single logical question they should have had, they didn't. And then at some point during the interview, which only lasted an hour and 32 minutes, in my opinion, based on the number of words they said and the number of minutes total, uh, about 132, or excuse me, um, about an hour and 30 minutes total, he said, okay, where do I start? And he agreed to tell the truth. And he said, yes, I shot her. They handed me the gun. They told me to shoot her or they will shoot me. And he said, how can you not believe the guy who admits he shot her? How could you not believe me when they set me up? He said, I shot her. He knows he was going to jail. And he says they made their first murder at age nine, Michelle and Josh. So whether that's true or not, that's just what he said they told him. Uh, in, his, in his depositions about uh, Tiffany, they claim that she wanted to be shot, which is not really relevant to a murder, other than the fact that you're going to call it a suicide. Now, the murder happened. Probably the family got insurance money. They don't tell me. I'd like to know if anybody has a way to find out if they got insurance money. But, you know, this is a very financial situation. That's why we hear book deals and those sorts of things. But specifically to Dan, uh, in, in case I didn't cover it, can you tell me once again what she actually wanted to know? Sorry. She was basically asking about how you felt about whether or not they had previously known her before that. Because the way that they do the interviews and some of the things they say actually implies that they did know her prior to the murder. That's right. He did not know her, but they did, period. I have a recording with her and Josh talking before her murder. They made up a whole new voice. 
we'll talk about this in a little while about the fact that they are able to cover things up by making new voices and making books online. I'll talk about that in a while. But she had a two part question on the Daniel Burnell part. So yes, Josh and Michelle knew her and Daniel Burnell did not. And then she had one more part of that, uh, the Daniel Burnell question, I think. Um, actually, I tell you what, while I'm looking for the previous question, I do have a question from Christina, and she asks, is there any new information that you can provide that hasn't been previously released in, um, you know, like the last year or two? Or What I've learned is, is that every single thing I've ever presented to the public Eventually, well, keep in mind that they listen to the stuff first, they being the group of people that are trying to stop me. And because they do, and because I, when I contacted the FBI and I said, I have information about a murder, a cover-up, and uh, certainly this information about her job. Now, they didn't want to investigate this case, which is odd, um, but I didn't know they really don't work on murders or anything for that matter. But as far as mm-hmm. new information, the only things I ever bring up now are not something that they can make a lie to because every single thing I've ever said since day one, and it's almost comical now because she called crying for help. They said, because she got kicked out of a hotel, they text me. She texts me in all capital letters. I have guns. I'm going to kill you from her account. The day she died, they said, I made it up. Well, I'm like, well, don't you have access to her cell phone? I mean, you know, for sure she texts the killers, but yet they don't check her phone. And in fact, in the the report for the uh, police report, they said, well, we have not sent her phone in, although we do have a warrant. We haven't sent her phone in yet as of the writing of this document that they were writing. And it's like, okay, so you didn't even get into her phone. How do you not get into the dead person's phone? That's beyond me. But you can get into my account. I She sent it to my Hotmail account. And if I made it up, Hotmail wouldn't have it, right? So somebody contacted me from her account the day she died and says, I have guns. I'm going to kill you. In all capital letters, Tiffany's not once in the whole year I knew her written to me, wrote, whatever, written to me in capital letters, right? So clearly it's related to the murder because that night she was dead. And uh, But to answer the question about new things, I mean, uh, I don't know specifically something that I have, but it depends what all she knows. There's so much, it's unbelievable. But if she ever has a specific area of questions, I have so much she doesn't know, it's not even funny. I mean, or nobody knows really. But... Uh, I know for sure that the doctor is the doctor I said, and it doesn't matter how, but I do know that. And, and uh, I'll show the host, but I, I'm not going to show the public because then they'll make an excuse. I know that uh, they said that Tiffany didn't have the ability to do damage on the dams because she was a ship worker, one of four. And I said, well, that's one of four, still one. And when they were out to lunch, she was still one, right? Yes. Okay, then that means she was in Good charge point. of the dam, like I said, and the uh, ship worker and all that's Yeah, so basically there's a ton of information, but without overwhelming people, if she has a specific uh, part of this, I'll tell her what she wants to know. All right, so I found that that huge, huge, long 10-part question. (laughs) We'll we'll, we'll do that a few first later, (laughs) but I think there was a part about Dan's interview that I missed. Yes, and it was, um, they also get into the killing and the interrogations. They show part of Dan's interrogation, and he says... The more he thought about it, the more he thought it was all planned out. Not by him, but by Josh and Michelle. Absolutely. That once again implies that Michelle and Josh knew her before this night. In Josh's tape, he says he sold his gun to Dan, and then he goes and kills someone with it. Dan confessed to shooting her, but maybe Josh actually shot her and threatened or forced Dan to confess to shooting her. And she said... Um, there are more things that lead me to believe that scenario. I could go on forever with all the questions I have about this case, so I will stop. But if you have time, can you please ask John Captain if he has seen this episode? Oh, that's right. And uh, if he has, what are his thoughts on it? Right. Well, it was very upsetting because not only because the, the family puts Tiffany down, but even the police were they, the police said something that was quite interesting. They said, um, why would they want to kill somebody that smart? And I remember going to the YouTube that they had that posted that show on, and there was 460, I think, 460 comments in like a week. And of course, the second I commented, they removed all comments, all 460 of them. But everybody said the same thing. What in the heck does her brain have to do with 
her getting murdered. So the police said, why is somebody that smart getting killed? That's weird. You know what I mean? And the public came, was very mad they said that. Yeah. But the show did not tell the story. And yeah, she was right. I'm Bill Ryan, the ex-boyfriend, loser, whatever they called me on the show, you know, which is fine. I don't mind being that person because I'm glad I'm not the one lying about my own child's murder. But uh, the show is 100% lie. I don't know how they get away with that, but they do. As far as uh, Daniel Burnell, I believe he shot her, and I believe that Josh handed him the gun. But what the public needs to ask themselves is this, is that are you telling me that somebody could give somebody a gun and then just, okay, so me and you go out, we shoot a girl, I just say, you bought the gun, it's yours. Well, I have a rule. Like, if this murder happens in a 24-hour period when you sold the guy the gun and you're the only one talking, we'll just pretend it's both of yours. How's that? Because, I mean, it's absurd yeah. to think that he sold the gun on a promissory note. He didn't pay for it that day. Yeah. He paid for it the next day. And uh, when you read Daniel Burnell's, and you can go to Tiffany Jenks' WordPress document to read that uh, interview. I believe that's there. I should check. But I think it is. Anyways, if it's not, we'll add it. But um, his interview was the only honest take of the whole entire murder. Clearly, about halfway through, he says, where do you want me to start? He says, they set him up, and he was drunk, wasted. She came in the car. They knew her before. They said, we love you. We love you. Let's go. And he said, I thought we were giving her a ride to her hotel room. That's what they told me. She was staying next door, which she was. Keep in mind, her, her hotel room was closer than the car was parked to get in the car to leave. Also, the ID discovery made one fatal mistake and then they gave the uh, CCTV footage of the uh, people getting in the car, Tiffany and the killers getting in the car. And you'll see that the CCTV footage jumps past every time you need to see that what's going on. But when you break it down, which I've done in frames per second, you're going to see that she didn't go there willingly with them and get in the car. And not only that, there's another person inside the sunroof of the car when they get in. So there's a fourth person. Plus, on the way out of the car, when, they, when the three pull in to uh, park the vehicle, there's another person in there, and the police just fast forward over those seconds. Um, but I've never seen a closed-circuit television camera recorder jump when it's digital, uh, jump from one number to the next. So it goes like 28, 29, 42. And, so, and I, did make yeah. a, I did make a post on one of the uh, CCTV footage uh, Facebook groups, and they all commented the same thing. It's not possible. So somebody doctored it. Yeah, it's definitely doctored. Yeah. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally have only seen clips of that particular episode, so she had watched it like two or three times in preparation. Good. She had a good question. I will say that uh, she might also recognize this ongoing dialogue about a book deal, um, and I make jokes about it because I don't think that her family should be trying to sell a book they wrote, but since day one on the news, it eased in with, my sister was writing a novel and she was going to travel the world. That's why she moved out of everywhere. So that nobody could search her home. She didn't have one supposedly, which is a lie, but she was going to travel and she was just getting ready to go tomorrow and then just got shot. So everything that at her home was not looked at, but regardless, and she was going to write a book to help her quit drinking. Well, let me guess. They have it. But also Tiffany told me that in a letter, it's not your book that was written. It's not your words. That's not your book. So I always tell them, yeah, she wrote a book for me, too, and I have it. It's all about you guys. I mean, dead people can write whatever they want, right? I mean, and that's the problem. So they've been marketing a book for since the beginning of this murder. All the way three times in ID Discovery, they talked about the book, how she was writing a book. So it's, you know, it's their book. They wrote the book. They're just trying to cover the fact that they are lying about the murder, and they cannot answer one single factual question about this case. So let me let me ask you this, uh, while we do have the family as a topic, a lot of people do accuse you of basically dragging this out and making the family relive it and rehash it over and over and over again, and that's always like a big topic that I always see, like whether it be in comments or on social media and stuff like that. So I guess what is your response to that and i and i you know it's it's a pretty rough question man it is i think it's fair with with me covering a lot of true crime cases um aside from this one obviously because this one there's a lot more stuff going on i mean i can understand that perspective yep. but at the same time i guess i want to know your take on it well 
backing up a little bit, how the story went down is I learned early on I was set up on this murder to be the killer. I would have, in my opinion, been on death row. I would have been killed. The plan was for them to have this Bill Martin guy who um, worked with Michelle warden Rosie at the uh, Rose City Mortuary, of all places, and drove hearse. He was here handling my money and working for me as one of the people I talked about earlier that befriended me. Um, and this Bill guy magically comes into my life and becomes very, very helpful. Okay, he's a you know, 55-year-old guy. And so at the time when Tiffany was murdered, he told me whoever killed her deserved a gold medal and to let it go. And I said, well, it doesn't work that way. And I blocked him. Shortly after the murder, now they make claims that I contacted her family. The only time I contacted her family in the beginning was to tell her sister she's a liar and I not once hit Tiffany ever. And I didn't. So after that, the police told me not to contact him. So I did. So then on November 26th, I started getting emails. Well, actually from her sister earlier than that, but on her, from her mother, November 26th, they had a goal. Find out what I knew, keep tabs on what I knew, and then use that information later to get a restraining order to stop me from telling the truth in this murder. Now, as far as the email exchange back and forth, it seems to me it says uh, they were trying to figure things out like what nationality. Okay, here's one. December 7, 2013. That's a wonderful picture of you and your mom, John. Your dad must have been another nationality because you don't look alike. What nationality is he? Question mark. Oh, that's weird. He's Eastern Shawnee, okay. tribe of Oklahoma, by the way, and uh, I'm glad you asked. Um, then she goes on to say, John, I'm getting a whole bunch of money. Where should I invest it? Now, keep in mind, I'm supposedly the bad guy, right? I'm the bad guy. They're asking me where to invest your money. I said, Kate, you have three gro- or four grown boys. You need to ask them where to invest your money. I have no business telling you where to put your money. However, if they don't know, put it all on Facebook. Yeah, I thought it was weird that you <laughs> asked me, right? That was my response. She would have been yeah. 10 million over. She invested all on Facebook. It was 30 bucks a share then. But uh, so <clears throat> this is December 6th, 2013. Now, she died October 8th, right? So we're talking 60 days. 60 days. It says um, he felt that the older couple would walk. And, uh, well, what do, you, what do you think about that? Uh, do you think the older couple will walk? And then she says, uh, and what would, it ha- what, would, what would it be like if they knew for sure they did it, you know, like for sentencing? This is uh, December 9th. But I'm haunted by the fact that she knew she was going to die. Why did she think that, question mark? So everything was actually, and believe me, at first, oh, man, I was like, I can't believe this has happened. I'm so horribly sorry. I will work on this. And I said all along, don't you want one of your sons to work on this with me, not you? Because it's kind of weird, right? Talking to the mother of yeah. a dead person about gross things like murder. So I always kept saying that I should be talking to one of your sons or a lawyer or somebody that wants to help. I invited them a hundred times to write the clues to the murder. And going back to that ID discovery and the accuracy of it, where they said I never met them, Tiffany's sister, Jennifer, had met me twice. So I don't know why it is they lie all the time, but came when Tiffany was alive to my place, and she came to get the clues in the murder at my place. So I don't know why they mm-hmm. said the show that we never met. And, oh, and I know the other one. As far as the restraining orders go, absolutely a lie. I never had one on her. She never had one on me. And that's one of the things where it's real easy for people to check with Multnomah County, where we both lived in Oregon, to answer the question, no, I never had a restraining order against Tiffany. She never had one against me. Her family's lying. Um, December 11th. Now, keep in mind, 60 days after she was dead, please don't regret how things worked out. You have the highest intentions for her, and she was just incapable of stopping. I know you hate to take antidepressants. They might do you some good. Maybe get something when you get back from Thailand. It does not sedate you. It helps you to see things brighter. It doesn't suddenly change you, but more how you respond to life. I think all my kids have taken them. Just a thought. It really helps the spouses. I'm pissed they're not listening to you, and I wish that they had been on the same page earlier, and we would have known what to, we didn't know what to believe at that time. And then uh, another one. I trust you, John. What does the, your cop friend think we should do next? I want you to solve this, and I trust you. So they, this goes on for days, and then what happens is, and now keep in mind, I'm 100% telling them everything I know, right? That was a bad idea. Mm-hmm. That was a really bad idea. Because I thought they were trying to get the killers in jail. That's not the case. Based on the evidence that I have and based on the email exchanges. So then it started like this. Now we're up to December 16th, what, 35 days. Jen said everything went well to the detectives and that they are very active in the investigation. And she thinks we need to back off and let them do their job. And then next day, December 26th. So maybe you should start taking care of yourself and your mom and sister and let them do their job. 
Nothing we do will bring her back. And at the end of the day, all of them will suffer in hell. I mean, I'm glad she's, I'm glad she's not suffering anymore. So to answer the question, so then it went down the line where it came to the point where I was like, you've never given me one single piece of paper. You've never given me the toxicology reports that you said she, she had whatever in her system. Nothing. You've never given me one thing. And, and then I said, if you don't give me stuff, I'm going to the defense or the other side, whatever they're called. And uh, so, and I did have a meeting with them twice with my cop friend, or not twice, once on the phone, and then I talked to them in person one day. And uh, they wanted to talk about Tiffany's drinking, so I told them to F off, and we ended up leaving. But bottom line was, all through the thing, they were just being nice. And then once they got what they needed, which was everything I knew, and I told them that I had this doctor's recording, and this is really weird, bam, blocked. Everything ended. Mm. Restraining order came after that. Once I told them that they were liars in this case, like the step-by-step that I learned this based on talking to them, and I told them all along, Tiffany set me up on this murder. What I didn't know was it wasn't just her involved in that, and the mind control thing was learned there shortly after. So, yeah, that's the situation on that. Now, I do have a a rabbit hole question for you. Do you have anybody that supports you that's that's on your side that is, I don't want to say the word underground, but just kind of in the shadows, you know, helping you out that, you know, might be a little bit secretive or anything. I duplicated um, Tiffany's life onto um, USB chips, which is a very odd thing. The first time it was very upsetting. I had her whole life on a USB chip and I thought, how weird is this technology? But I think that the public should be smart enough to know that they should also back stuff up because this case is weird. And the reason it's weird is because it actually solves the world's question about different parts of corruption, mind control, and then the such that people could get away with murder uh, and those sorts of things. But as far as like backing it up, I have multiple copies in coconut trees around the world. And I also have people uh, in different countries that I've met that won't buy into the idea that John is the abusive ex-boyfriend that beat her up with a crowbar. So let us get away with murder. Yeah. And that was what my question was more directed to was actual people. Like, are there people, like, on your side that just kind of hang out in the background that support you and yeah. help well, you out and stuff like that? Not enough. And I know for sure that and it's part, partly my fault because the learning curve for getting harassed for dealing with Tiffany's murder is huge. And I've probably shunned or whatever you call it or, or removed from my life a thousand people or something over time. And because I don't know who to trust. And I know for sure that any wrong word or any wrong dealings, I just don't even say anything. I just block them. And that's not fair because I know that some people are, they have good intentions, but if they have information about something or they, uh, because basically you have 4,000 cult members than me. So it's a lot easier if it's just me and I have everything ready than it is to, because everything I do, in my opinion, is watched. My phones, my emails, my every single thing. Everybody I talk to for business-wise, they all get contacted. In fact, I was talking to a uh, person I dealt with like 20 years, uh, a newspaper here in Portland. And when I called to talk to him out of the blue, I hadn't talked to him in three years. I was out of the country. I said, hey, who I was? And we were talking. And I go, he got a phone call. I go, don't answer that. I guarantee you who it is. And sure enough, they were trying to stop him from talking to me. And so it's actually comical because then I can kind of play games with them and, uh, you know, like do text or take map fake mapping to addresses i'm not going to but but yeah when you talk about edward snowden and his story about trying to tell america that we're being trapped or attacked attacked personally when we make our phone calls or do our faxes or emails we are we are under attack and the government has absolutely no right to or whoever it is but i shouldn't say just like i don't know if it's the government or what but i do know this anybody wants to email me just try it, and you want to see how fun it is, and they'll just contact you too. But my email is my name, John Captain at hotmail dot com, and then you'll have the uh, benefit of seeing it live. Yeah. Or you can comment at my business, which is Portland Tub and Tan in Portland. Just say something like, "Hey, I went to your place. When are you going to open?" Or some just random, nice, general thing. And eventually, you'll probably get contacted by somebody that's an investigator or the fa- friend of the family. I have one email they sent, which was from the family both from her mom and her sister all in one, they forgot who they were when they sent it to the customer of mine that forwarded it to me. It was about how horrible I am. But in the email, they're like, and my mom, and then they go, 
but my sister, so that they actually forgot who they were in the conversation. So they're really good at, at uh, you know, revealing themselves uh, at attacking me. So, no, I try not to have, especially uh, ones they know about, anybody help me do anything. I do it all on my own. And uh, that way we'll all see the results of my work and also the results of their actions against me. I do. Uh, speaking of, of work, how does your businesses or and or your employees like react to this kind of stuff? Because at this point in time... Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer radio show on demand every day wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. They're probably not oblivious to who you are, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, one of my – the main manager right now is in the hospital, but um, some kind of uh, stomach issue. But um, regardless – She's been there 12 years, and they're all very familiar with it, and um, I talk about it all the time. Uh, every discussion leads to it. So, But uh, I left the country for two and a half years so I could focus on just this case, and uh, the place didn't run well, but it didn't fold, if you will. And then, yeah. uh, But when I got back and I started to see what was happening, I, I noticed that two of the employees were turning people away. And I had to go back in the uh, archives of DVR recordings to try to get understanding of what was going on. But clearly the cult had affected them and got them to lie. One of the things they did, uh, you can go to ripoff report, just type in John Captain or Portland Tub and Tan, and you'll see one of their fine works displayed there where they claim that I put cameras in my rooms. Well, you know, I've been there 28 years and I assume that Portland police would be fully aware if I did, and it's kind of weird that these people found out, but not the police. But of course, I would never put a camera in a room after 28 years or even or even ever. And uh, when they investigated the murder, they came here. They looked around. I let them look at whatever they wanted, although they claimed that I asked for a warrant. But if I did ask for, oh, that's another thing that she may have noticed, that they said I asked for a warrant. I never asked for a warrant. I, that's offensive to me. And I was highly upset. The picture of her family smiling ear to ear shows that they weren't upset. So if, mm-hmm. they are, if somebody wanted to listen to my interview with the police of me crying the whole time and freaking out, then they can. But I can't stomach listening to it. But I can tell you this. Nothing affected my life ever like this that, that was the murder. My mom's death didn't even affect me that much because we expected at some point our parents will pass away of cancer, especially um, sooner than later. And uh, I'm not sitting here dwelling on my mother's death. I know all people die. I get that. What I'm talking about is I was set up on murder by these dirty police. They have a right to do that currently. And I want to remove their right to set people up on murder in the future. I believe police that get paid by taxpayers should tell the truth and say they use any means possible. One of them is to capture my emails and make sure that I get no help. But if I'm not looking for help, then they have a hard time stopping me. Let me go back in time a little bit, because in the first interview, you touched on it very, very briefly. And let's go back and talk about the person who was on the sidewalk outside your place, uh, I believe with an iPad, recording. I I believe they were like taking pictures or recording. Yeah, there was multiple, multiple people. And, And this is the reason the police want to claim that I asked for a warrant. But let me just say this. If you ask for uh, CCTV footage from a business and you're investigating a murder, <clears throat> we first have to agree they have a gun, I don't. Okay, they have a radio, I don't. And they have a vested interest to actually get the CCTV footage that I hold on my DVR. If I tell them no, 
isn't that the same thing that happens if you get a warrant when somebody's driving down the road and you think they're smoking marijuana or they have crack cocaine in their car? Don't they call and get one of those warrants? But for a murder, for a scientist, for the U.S. government, and for the out-of-control boyfriend that beat her up with a crowbar or whatever story they give people, why wouldn't they get a warrant to get the evidence in a murder that they claim in the ID Discovery show that Tiffany left behind at my house? See, because... What happened was the first policeman that I called after I found out about the murder, I called uh, on the phone, 911. And the officer Johnson came to my house. I invited him here. I let him in. I never asked him about a lawyer. He said, I asked about a lawyer. Why would I ask for a lawyer? I invited him here. I never even thought about a lawyer. So then he said that me and Tiffany did not have sex when I said we did. And then he said that she left stuff here, bags. So he goes away and wrote his report. Now that's locked in. He can't change it. He's also the one that wrote that the bartender said she was going to die in the report. She was upset, crying, and said it was the end of her life in that report. Once that's filed, now he's stuck. The next day, the two investigators come to talk to me, and uh, they spend an hour and 30 minutes or so here, and they leave. And then I get the police reports four years later, and it says, John said she left bags there, but we couldn't have them because he wanted a warrant. Now, I would have to believe the public would demand that they got a warrant and they got those bags without, without leaving ever or even losing the eyesight of them or losing sight of them, excuse me, because why would they leave such an important clue to a murder at my house if it was true, right? Yeah, most so, definitely. What is the part about this case that I think uh, people usually get wrong when they either watch a TV show, or even listen to a podcast where people are just just blatantly talking a bunch of crap and not even really bringing facts. Like, what is the most... I mean, it's hard to say the most because there's several, but what is the most consistently wrong information that people involved in this case or in the TV shows or whatever the case might be what is consistently wrong that you keep seeing that you need to correct people on? Well, I think the most important part of it is that we don't need to put the drunk girl that's a prostitute who lost her way because her dad died down now that she's dead. And because anytime you fill that airtime with that nonsense, you're not talking about the case, right? Yeah. And there's no reason to cover Tiffany being a drunk loser. There's no reason to say I hit her. They all agree I did not kill her supposedly i believe they believe that so once we're past those two things they pretty much have run out of things to talk about except josh and michelle if you listen to any of the shows never will you hear them put down josh and michelle now mm -hmm. josh and michelle are likely the ones that got paid by somebody which we still haven't found out paid by somebody to murder tiffany now josh knew her father because the recording proves it josh went or excuse me tiffany went to therapy and the doctor talked about her being under people's control. And he also says, you'll get the answers when you die. And not to talk to mm -hmm. me about this or to make her a target and targets get shot at first. Now, I think the biggest part of it all is, is that, that um, nobody's telling the truth at all. And it won't take but a few sleuths, uh, web sleuths, when they find this case and they um, get past all the put downs that John's a complete idiot. Once they start looking into the case and they're, they're like, well, wait a minute here. That doesn't even make sense. Once a college or somebody logical other than your show and a few others, once they start putting the pieces together, they're going to have a hard time defending themselves because all they talk about is stuff that's completely irrelevant to the murder. Tiffany was killed 19 minutes after they left that bar, period. Supposedly, Josh and Michelle never heard the gun go off, and then the police just randomly let them go get married, and then they got to walk into the police station after supposedly they were questioned in Kelso, uh, a town 45 minutes from here, in Washington. So what I would always say is what were they questioned about that would lead the police to believe that they should release them when that they drove the car there, took off the serial numbers, brought the gun, brought the killer. Another thing people don't know too is that the DA said that it was the next day that they took them to the bus station. And the problem with that yeah. is that they were trying to cover that it's not a run of the crime. And of course it is. They have been charging people for run of the crimes for, you know, hundred years. If you complete a crime and you take somebody to the bus to get him out of the state, which they did, it's not it's still a run of the crime because he's getting the weapon and taking it out of state of Oregon to go to California. They had a bus at six AM that he was supposed to be on. He ended up getting the eleven thirty bus 
But to say that when somebody dies at 2.30 in the morning and they get, catch a bus at 6 a.m. or even 11 a.m., that it's a different day, I, I mm-hmm. understand why it wasn't a different day for all the black men in jail because they had to do the run of the crime uh, sentencing. But for this girl or this guy, it's not. That's insane. Let's go back to this recording real quick about the conversation between her and Josh. Now, a lot of people always overlook that, but it's literally proof that they had known each other, and they actually talk about the gun in that recording. Do you have that recording right offhand? Yep. Can you yep. play it? Uh, yeah, I will. I want to t- say something else about that, too, is that the reason why, when I rebuilt Tiffany's phone that um, she had a mine, by the way, I never found from her Google searches that she had typed in Josh Robinette or Joshua Robinette. But what I did find out from somebody else later on that does the same type of investigating, he says, well, you can also type in multiple uh, letters, and that changes the search results inside of a, of, a, of a box that you type in. But I never typed in two consonants and the letter PVT for private, PVT. Who would have thought I type in PVT, right? And it would pop mm-hmm. up private Josh Robinette that she had searched already. I do know for sure that I contacted the Veterans Hospital because in the recording with Josh, he was in the hospital, and Tiffany says, you were in the hospital. I tried to call you. That number from the hospital was still in her phone, so it surely was the recorded person that she was talking to that was in the hospital, the VA. Also, if public goes to Google right now and types in PVT, Private Josh Robinette, you'll see a interview he did. That interview was removed shortly after her murder, because if you go to Wayback Playback, it tells you when it was removed. They removed all the stuff, and when I contacted the agency that was holding that interview, they said they didn't have it anymore conveniently. But uh, regardless, yeah, so in terms of Josh's audio, this is a recording she made days before she was dead, and I'll just play part of it here. I don't know. a relationship that I can have. Tell me, so this is what so I want to know, because, like, what happened with... Let her calm down. See, this is why I want to talk to you. Because what and happened with me... That's something else I've learned in life. When I was younger, I would have stayed on the situation and probably made it worse. I know. Now, what they claim is that that's not the person that killed Tiffany. Now, here's another section that says, Josh, so glad you called me. Like, as if you popped back into her life days before she was dead. What they want you to believe is that the interview audio they provided us from the police is not his voice. I do believe they did whatever they had to do to make sure it was not his voice. But do I think that Tiffany knew two Josh Robinettes that buy guns and kill people? I don't think so. Josh, do me a favor. I'm going to because I need you. Oh. Please think of me next time, too. I know it's really selfish. I also don't know how sick I am right now. Like, I'm out. We live in a mentally ill society as it is. We're all. So the recordings that I have are a prime example of something that I provided that was evidence that I received the minute I did. And it was weird, too, because when I went to court for the restraint order, they said, yeah, and he got into her iCloud. You gave me the passwords. You gave me the passwords to get into her account. And then when I got in, immediately I notified the family and said I got in. Apple admitted, or told me rather, that it was completely deleted out and gone. There was nothing inside, nothing. Well, when I put the phone, linked it back to my account on iTunes, because we shared family share, and the iTunes is held on a computer, not on in the cloud, and I put the application of audio note back into the phone, here popped up six recordings about Tiffany knowing she was going to die. They can make changes. The doctor's not the doctor, and Josh is not the Josh. And But if the public believes that, there's really no point in explaining it. I mean, at, past that point. Uh, I can play a clip from the doctor as well. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's do so that. This is from the doctor about vampires. The people that are embodying demons and all this shit, you're not going to go anywhere. Because the whole purpose is to do it. Yeah. And it's not that I can do anything. I see something in there. I know where it makes a difference. Let me explain it to you when it's difficult. Yeah. There's a war going yeah. between the light and the dark. Yeah. And I people know. that are of the light are being attacked by people of the dark. And I will tell you, that's going to get a lot worse. Yeah, I, I don't know who you are, and you should never tell anybody who you are. All right? 
nobody that doesn't know doesn't need to know. You know why? Because it will make you a target. And a target get shot at first. And five days later, approximately, she was dead. Now, Dude, that, that clip, as many times as I've heard it, still yeah, just... Yeah. It creeps actually, me it, out, man. Yeah, it, it gives you. It makes your hair stand up. Um, also, what about this follow the Elbic Road one here? I'll play that for him if you'd like. Yeah, for sure. I need to follow the Elbic Road. There's like, 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 You do need to follow the Elbic Road. If you think your time is short, as you said, three or four times, you ain't got much time. If you're already thinking your time is short, you need to clean up your shit, get it going, and do whatever you need to do. You know, the only way that that God can help you do, or God or Spirit or whatever yeah, 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 universe yeah, yeah, yeah. can help yeah. you do that, is if you are Him. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if her life, if her time is short, and in other parts of the recording, which people can listen to on YouTube, just type in Tiffany Jenks therapist, uh, John Captain or something like that. Um, if the therapist slash guru says you'll get the answers when you die and then she dies and he says, don't tell anybody about this or you'll be a target target should shot up first. And, and those kind of weird things are like, I'm going to go, he says he's going to use the bathroom and she says she's going to go in the bathroom with him. And he says, well, you can't touch me. Unfortunately, I have a girlfriend right now. Otherwise it wouldn't matter. Now, when I submitted this to Oregon licensing board for therapists, magically, mm-hmm. Shortly after, not only did they not investigate, they used the word, we don't investigate uh, conspiracy theories. The government has an obligation to protect the public, which they're not. And then shortly after that, they come up with this idea that it's a guru. Now, um, addressing that is that the other side of the opposition, if you will, they came to the conclusion that I had these recordings and I shared them with the transcripts I made. And they didn't like what he said because it doesn't fit with the idea that she was randomly killed. It kind of fits with she's crying for help and she needs help. She's going to die. And he didn't do anything about it. Now, so along the way, like everything else, they made an excuse. So here's the excuse they said. John, we found out who the real doctor is. You're wrong. Okay. What do you mean? Well, um, now, keep in mind, first, this was two women that contacted me first independently, uh, just randomly, that I know and that I've known since the mind control victims came to my place. And they said to me, no, he wrote a book. Okay. In the book about demons. Okay. Because he talks about demons with Tiffany in the the recordings. And uh, yeah, and he put his book online, the first chapter on YouTube. And I said, well, that chance of that, I'm not going to even bother. And then was shortly thereafter that Rick Lovett got a hold of me to tell me who's the person that, you know, from Portland that has been the most, you know, outspoken about the fact that I'm absolutely wrong about my allegations. But uh, he tell, told me, John, you've got the wrong. In fact, he just emailed me yesterday or tonight, even same thing. And I, I can read it for you, but it was the same story that I have the wrong doctor. And he says, but if you do have evidence that it's the different one or that it is, we've been, I'd like to see it. Well, you know, what would happen if I provided that, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, it, they would come up with an excuse. But if people went to YouTube and they typed in The Coiled Needle, you would get a book by Jonathan Shell, The Coiled Needle here, and you would get a book that uh, was supposedly a book about demons that Rick Lovett found online that was the same voice as the doctor that Tiffany had, and by God, he wrote a book and put it online, and he found it. And then not only did he find it, but he thought he should tell me. And not only should he tell me, but he wants me to believe I got the wrong doctor. And all this happened after Tiffany was dead. Now, the coiled needle. Now, is this his voice? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to play a second of it. There's a hierarchy of energy. The closer one is to this initial division, the more energetic its nature. The further away from this... So he's talking about guru stuff, and he's a self-proclaimed uh, acupuncturist who works on people who have problems, and, and sometimes they talk about vampires. I said, well, that's fine. Um, sure. Fucking I said, well, then so you can... weird, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely insane. But the point of the point is, and then they told me, well, John, you can call the doctor's cell phone. I mean, uh, answer machine and listen to his voice. I guess they think I'm completely stupid to believe them. And keep in mind. Now you talked about the family. Mm-hmm. They have the visa slip. They, they have her visa slip. Why would they protect the doctor over their own daughter? Why? Would you? 
I no, sure as heck absolutely would. not. I would do anything to protect my child from people like them. I would never allow a doctor to tell my daughter she might get shot. And when she said she was going to die, he said, then why are you here? Well, the part that troubles so, me probably you know, the most is literally like days before she died. Whether you're a guru, an acupuncture guy, a <laughs> clinical therapist, time. whatever. Like, why would you say something to the effect of, if you keep talking, that's going to make you a target and targets right. get shot at for like it, it just bo- absolutely boggles my mind. Like I don't understand that. I mean, yeah, I do yeah, understand it. it. Like it's just it's crazy. It's just we're under it's attack. Absolutely we crazy. Oh no, it really is what it comes down to. We are under attack. And the thing is, if you look at the facts that they will not investigate him, even if he's a guru, the state licensing division for Oregon should be making sure that he's not having customers end up dead. And if you don't believe the tap, tap, tap is mind control, fine, no problem. Then we move on to the next thing where he says, you'll get the answer when you die. She told them she was going to die. And he says, she says, watch it. You're going to watch it with me. And she says, it's not going to be like vampires are on TV. Well, maybe it is. And he says, yes, I will watch it with you. So what is this that she, he's going to watch? I don't know. But uh, the doctor also did not like me in the sense that he told her every single second, don't like him, don't shut up about him. And, and the first recording where she's not as drunk, she, it's a lot more clear, I think, on the mm-hmm. uh, audio, she says she's in love with me, which I'm thankful for because I was in love with her too. And I didn't want to. I didn't want to be in love with somebody that wasn't in love with me. But whether she was programmed to love me or not, it really doesn't matter. It worked if they did. She did love me, and I know that because we weren't dating for two months, and she told him she was in love. Period. He didn't like that. Do you have the audio clip of that? Yeah, I have a bunch of them. We can play a few of these. Yeah, for sure. A mantra that keeps going through your head. It comes out a little bit different, but. You keep repeating similar stuff that people don't care and that people are, you know, like that the world's going to go to hell and people are going to die. And like, there's like, it's all this darkness. It's it's (laughs) And you're totally all wrapped up in it. Why? Caring. You are totally projecting. You're projecting this. This is going to happen. Not even. You can project things when you when you see what what I do. Since I take it back, and I read simulations, and I you know I managed to deliver. And then that's the one short math game. I know in 24 hours the water that goes through Vancouver Dam is going to go through bottom of You know, that's just one way of a small analogy to say that you can apply those things to different parts of life. And I'm not some stupid girl. I'm going to do you should listen to and I'm not trying to make a change. I don't know what the fuck to do either. I am not calling you stupid. I am but I'm just saying that, that, like, you're right and thank you. But, um, why? Because it is fucking devastating. And it is hard to watch. And it does hurt to watch it. To watch it. You're going to watch it with me. Of course not. I mean, it's not like going to be like all the TV shows with the vampires and then whatever. And the movie and then, you know. But so. It's so convoluted. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's disgusting, but it makes you want to shoot yourself in the head. Only, I guess, if you're you. I mean, not really. I'm not really gonna go from the session and shoot myself in the head. But I'm saying hypothetically, theoretically. Did he just say when she said that? Did he just say only if you're you? Yeah. <laughs> What the f- Unreal, oh, no, man. Oh, no, it's so convoluted. I mean, I'm not going to say it. It's disgusting. But it makes you want to shoot yourself in the head. Only, I guess, if you're you. I mean, not really. I'm not really going to go from the session and shoot myself in the head. But I'm saying, hypothetically, theoretically, and, like, everything, like, 
if you know it makes you take a look at that picture, it would make a normal person want to shoot an at me. I mean, say I'm normal, okay, fine. Shoot yourself in the motherfucking head. Because everything's fucked. That's your, you're wearing ruby lenses. Okay, I'm going to pause for a second right there. I want to explain the yeah. next part. She's going to say my words, and you'll kind of hear a smile in her, in her speech, but she's smiling, but she's saying my words. And I hate Oregon Lottery, and I hate uh, uh, that businesses are all getting ruined long before COVID. And she's going to say my words, and then he's going to go, Tiffany, your cup's half empty. And then he, she'll say, it's not my cup. Okay, here we go. No, there's not really lenses. I wish they were. It's like when you already, you know, in video lottery, it's like when small business is gone in America, you know, we're gone. And, um... Your cups are empty, Kirby. Oh, it's not my cup. Baby. Your perspective on the light is half empty. We can always see your perspective, and I can be I can be okay at all times. I know that I only kill myself. I've never hurt myself. Got him to cut my finger, and that was an accident. Not really hurt, but no, I'm trying to hurt myself. But um, no, I'm gonna fight this one out. You know, like but seriously, like it's really fucking hard to watch. Cause it's like, really, why do I even put effort into this? Why am I trying to do this? And so, like, I hope that there's something more. Bottom line is that she ended up. Some people claim to me, which I, I'm not a subscriber of this theory, but that uh, maybe her whole situation wasn't as what we're being told in America. Like maybe they collect on insurance and they move people along to other locations. The mm -hmm. recordings kind of suggest that maybe um, she's aware of what's happening in this case. And that, um, and uh, part two will be that um, she comes back to tell your, her own story or something. You know, I don't know, but it's not my story. Trust me, I'm not crazy. It's not my story. I'm just telling you what other people tell me all the time, which is that, John, don't ever say she's dead. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, because they need her to run the dams. I'm like, oh, my God, you guys are nuts. So anyways, um, but regardless of that, um, the doctor's weird. And more importantly is, is that, like, when you talk about this case being weird, that's the whole problem is that there's every single element of this case proves that this is not a conspiracy theory, that certainly there's a cover-up of huge proportions and that the public is getting lied to in all the way around, not just in one way, but multiple ways, whether it be the doctor having the right to cheat people out of their lives, or maybe um, the fact that the killers are out of jail. And the girl got out in 11 days from her part of the murder. And then have you heard by, by chance, have you heard the, uh, the judge sentencing for her? Um, no. If you haven't, you should, you should. Okay. So uh, I guess you can pause right there for some of the things that came out like initially in the news about the story of Tiffany dying was odd. And when you listen to the recordings now that we all know exactly what we were told happened and we know the information that I've provided, we hear um, from uh, the news. I'm going to play that right now. This is one of the news at that time. Near the entrance of Blue Lake Park in Fairview early yesterday morning. Right away, cops started investigating it as a homicide. And now we know that she died from a gunshot wound. Okay, so the part I want to play is the part where they interview a gentleman that is a guru also, I guess, and he is um, Darren Littlejohn, and he's going to talk about Tiffany in the sense that, did they tell him that she was dead already? Because it's really odd what he says. Um, he says stuff that makes you want to believe that I beat her up, but he should be told before he says that that she's already dead. So here it is. Let's try and play that of cancer. Jennifer says Tiffany took it hard and turned to drugs and alcohol. She joined Darren Littlejohn's Buddhist recovery program, but he hadn't heard from her since June, and he worried she was using again. I thought she may have, but I questioned her about it, and she said she hadn't, so it's just hard to know. Darren says Tiffany also told him about the violence in her last relationship, and he can't bear to think of anyone hurting her. She was a very petite woman and uh, just the thought of anybody um, causing harm to her she would be unable to defend herself police will only say this is a homicide investigation and tiffany's family can only hope for justice she had a lot to give and she didn't deserve this and you know, cause, cause you ever did it 
And we have learned that investigators have spoken to Tiffany's ex-boyfriend, but again, they have not identified any suspects in this case. So he says that she's very petite and likely mm -hmm. she would not be able to defend herself. Did anybody tell him that she was already dead? Because the response is, okay, so she's dead. So well, I think no longer... I think he was the defending herself. I think he was referring to if she would have either had to fight somebody off or even fought off like you, for instance. Me. Oh, exactly. I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I get that. But I think it's odd that, um, and I, I could be wrong that they tried. I think it's weird that he spoke in the sense of her being able to defend herself to anyone, even me, because she's already dead. Yeah, for sure. It's just not a logical. I would think, and I never knew anybody to die, so I don't know what I would say if they came up and interviewed me, you know, hey, she's dead. Um, I don't think she'd be able to defend herself. Well, it's a little late for that thought. She's already dead. I mean, so anyway, yeah. I thought that was weird. And, um, but in, in terms of the, uh, the other one we were talking about, which is the, uh, this is the judge who's doing sentencing for Michelle Ward and Brosey for her part of the murder. And uh, it appears that, um, you know, religion and all these things matter to him. So here it goes. At the same time, some of that was just for Michelle Ward Brosey, which I appreciate. Um, I thought there were some very important statements that were made by everybody here today. Uh, perhaps one of the most significant ones being one of Mr. Day's comments just a moment ago about Ms. Ward Brosey's actions, conduct, decisions, feelings about whether she's worthy of being alive. I think that's a very significant statement. Yeah. when they have lived that kind of a fringe life. And that's not present here. Okay, here it is, right? Here. That kind of a background. The, the, with Ms. Warden Brosey. What we have instead is someone who clearly seems to be trying now. And so for the court, the question is, how much does that offset the horrors that she engaged in earlier, that she participated in? We're not talking about someone who merely covered up something at the end, although, in fact, those were the charges that she was found guilty of after upon her plea. But she was present at the proceedings, the before, the during, and the after, not necessarily at the shooting itself, obviously. Um, we may never know that. I can't completely disassociate her conduct from that. Um, I pay attention to things that your pastor has told us about how she is beginning to take root, and that the concern is that if she's sent to prison now, the roots will loosen. It may be harder for her to regain her footing, and she may go off to the wrong direction. The spirituality that she's experiencing now and the treatment that she's in now don't prohibit, however, the idea that someone is to be held accountable for the community. In fact, the DBT programs spend a lot of time talking about appropriate consequences. What are the appropriate consequences for conduct? And when someone is not served the appropriate consequences, the concern is, is that they will not learn from their mistakes and they will repeat them. Okay, so she drives the car, she has the gun, she drives there, and she magically does not hear the gun go off. And this judge says he cares about what she has to think. And I never heard him talk about Tiffany once. And I'm taking all of that into account. And I'm hoping that Ms. Wharton Rosie is taking those into account because she's learning as she's going. And I think perhaps for the first time in her life, she's gaining as compared to losing. In my view, to leave Ms. Wharton Rosie on probation without any type of prison sentence would not be serving her in long-term interests and certainly would not be serving the interests of the community or the victim's family. And these are all appropriate considerations. But everything that has been said in support of Ms. Warden Brody makes me think that there is no reason why I need to consider a sentence as long as Mr. Ramers has suggested, even though there is a legal basis for his suggestion and there's a factual basis for it. But there isn't a need for it. So I've thought about this for some time. I've had weeks and weeks to consider it. And, and it, 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 at the same time, I've been learning as I've been going throughout all these proceedings. And I've concluded that the appropriate sentence for Ms. Warden Rosie is 13 months in prison. 
total. And it's going to be 13 and 13 concurrent. So he gives her 13 months and a two dollars fine. And uh, I hope that nobody ever pays a fine over 200 ever again if they do refer to this judge. And it also, 150 was waived, so that makes it $50 fine for murder. And I'll never, ever in my lifetime ever be willing to pay a fine of anything above $50. That is so. insane that yeah, 13 they all work together. months and a $50 fine for being yeah. an accomplice to murder. It was her gun. She brought it across state line. See, that's a weird thing, too. They protect each other so well. They will never talk bad about a cult member. Never. You never hear anybody say a darn word about Michelle in negative light. Ever. Ever. Or you probably don't hear him say anything at all. Do you know any of her past? I know that her family had contacted me that parts of them that did not really like her and said she's part of the Eastern Star uh, cult and that um, basically... Um, you know, that, that she spent her lifetime in that, that, you know, she's probably a, just like Tiffany, a mind control victim. And that, uh, you know, I mean, she was letting her molest, letting her kid get molested. So she can't be that great of a person. Let's, let's talk about that. I was going to bring that up. Sorry to interrupt you. I was actually no getting ready to bring that up. Yeah. This yeah, but, happened but, but, after the murder of Tiffany, like that night or the next day, right? Well, they got back to the hotel, DA says, based on the CCTV footage at 340 in the morning after killing her at 230 in the morning. And so the after party was the daughter who was at a, you know, a large hotel room waiting uh, for her mother to get home from killing Tiffany. But, and I don't know how they pay for all these things, by the way, they even paid for a week's hotel in Kelso when they left there. So they go to the hotel and the shooter, who's been the only honest one, even more honest than the police, said he got sick because he couldn't believe it. He went to the bathroom and puked. Now, he didn't do that over the murder, but he did it over witnessing what he did. And what he was alluding to is what exactly what Josh Robinette was charged with, which was uh, child molestation. Now, keep in mind, part of that could possibly be that they needed to make sure I never heard his audio in court. So they were able to do say that and then seal the case, seal the case so that they wouldn't get life and murder or, or actually in Oregon would be the death penalty. So they really, really needed to get John's audio from Tiffany's account gone. Now, if Tiffany is scared for her life and she's going to die. And she records, I would think that I have the right to play that in a court of law and say, here's her recordings. She knew she was going to die. But because they wanted to remove that from her, even her own family didn't want copies told to anybody, which was weird. They uh, basically, Michelle Warden Brosey brought the daughter back to the hotel. And then uh, Josh and her were in the bed together having sex with her, I believe. With her, I should say. They said Josh molested her and that she was really mad about it. <laughs> Whatever that means. I will not, I can't even... I can't even tabulate what that would mean. <laughs> and all that was brought up in, in court, right? Correct. It, it was, um, yeah, it was not only brought up in court, but uh, everybody else was very aware of it. Um, that was sealed the, okay. as far as the child molestation charge, but everybody is in agreement that it happened. I'm just not quite sure the details of what transpired because that part was sealed, but he was charged. You can look it up on his file in Multnomah County, and it's on the record. And also, I would say, too, that they took off every single charge both of them had, Michelle and Josh, as soon as the judge was assigned, they called it specially assigned to the case, all charges were removed except for one thing for Michelle. And that was after they drove to Kelso and hit out in the hotel and, and they went to Radio Shack to buy new cell phones and change their hair color. While they were at Radio Shack, they saw on the news that there was a dead girl. And they looked at each other. They didn't speak about it. They only looked at each other. And they left, and then um, when they went to go get married at the courthouse in Washington State, they uh, didn't tell that cop that was over there. So the only charge she ever got, or he ever got, except for the um, uh, molestation, was that when they were at Radio Shack, they saw it on the news, and they didn't report it. That's all. There was no other charge or any other information brought up. What was Josh's final sentence for all of this? Well, they both got 13 months in jail and a $200 fine. 150 was reduced down to 50 And Josh also got child molestation charges of about four years total. So 13 months for the murder, three years. They were running concurrent. So he, he's already even out a long time. In fact, he already beat up his new wife and then went back to jail for a day, I think it was, during COVID. But um, so, yeah, and uh, if anybody has his audio, that'd be great. I'd like to hear his voice because I think it sure matches mine. Uh, that I have on the audio. So, but yeah. Uh, yeah, 13 months for murder is just insane. And, and it only can happen if everybody lies. And if they ever gave me a day in court, which I deserve, 
I would just say, I know that you guys are all lying. I know it's personal to you, but I'm going to tell the truth. And you guys don't have the right to stop me from putting my facts on the record because that's the society we live in. We're a free country. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think this would probably be a good stopping point for the round two here. What do you think, John? Yeah, I appreciate your guys' uh, help on getting justice for Tiffany and, uh, and definitely, uh, I'm glad to have people that care and ask logical questions. That's good. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That's, uh, one thing I love about my group and uh, a lot of my listeners, like they keep an open mind and they are many of them, like I said, are just trying to just trying to process a lot, a lot, a lot of information. But at the same time, all of them pretty much agree. Like, something isn't right and i'm glad that we were able to play those recordings tonight and kind of go over those because god man those things just they yeah. just raise the hair on your arms you know it's it's really really weird man yeah and and t- in, in the end of the day like you've said before there's a dead girl there's a dead girl that deserved justice and um no matter what anybody else says it goes back to that there's a dead girl murdered Nobody's telling the truth. I'm trying to speak for her because she's not here to do so. And I think that um, it's important that we remember nobody in the whole world has the right to justice except her. And I'm trying to make sure that happens. So, Yeah, I absolutely agree, man. And I think you're doing a great job. And I know you got a lot of people out here that straight up hate on you, man. And I'm 100% sure I'm, I'll get all kinds of shade thrown at me, too, for these two interviews. But... I really don't care. <laughs> you know, I've, it's I've got America. It's what you want it to be. And I think that if you have to, if you can get harassed for telling the truth, if there's anything I said that wasn't true, then let me know. And I'll definitely like to hear anybody's uh, opinion about it. But I know for sure the hundred facts that I bring forward to the, her case are simply facts to a murder. And I wouldn't even be having this discussion if they weren't all lying. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. And, uh, before we go again, do you want to go ahead and give your information again for your YouTube channel and stuff like that? Yeah, I have a um, free uh, YouTube for Tiffany stuff, and it's under John Captain, and you'll see a red X. It has like 600 subscribers or something like that. So anyways, and then also uh, my email, which is John Captain at Hotmail. And then Tiffany's Facebook page I made, which uh, is Tiffany Jenks Murder. And then also... If people are warriors for Tiffany eventually, that'd be awesome. And then they could go um, on like Reddit because I can't type. So, you know, and just put up a battle for Tiffany's case if you feel like it. But I appreciate everybody's assistance in trying to get justice. Hell yeah, man. I agree. And obviously I'll be keeping in touch. Excellent. Have a great night. All right. Talk to you later, John. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye.